Hey, good morning. Good morning. Uh, as we are coming together, um, summer's about to start. I know it's hard to believe. It's a little <coughs> cloudy outside. But uh, as I ask this question, would you rather have 95 degrees and hot or this? This. this. Yeah. You're on my side. Um, uh, before we start, can we just kind of like turn around, reach out, and just say hello, good morning to those around us? So with that said, let's go to the passage this morning. It comes from 1 John chapter 4, 19 to 21. The letter of John chapter 4. And the word of the Lord says, We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. Let's pray. Lord, as we are coming together on this day, a day that is set aside for you, I hope, Lord God, that we make Sundays the worship of our God, of our Lord, be a priority in our life. We trust, Lord God, that in our walk from Sunday afternoon to next Sunday morning, that you are guiding us and leading us, and we experience things both joyous and maybe frightening. We look around and we see chaos in so many different corners, and Lord, we don't understand, but Lord God, we're going to trust that somehow in some way that you're with me and each one of us so that we could be that one light that makes a difference, that we will be that spark that makes a difference in people around us. So Lord God, may we just hold on to the promise that you're always there with us, regardless of all circumstances. And Lord God, may today be a day that we give our very best to you. We know, Lord God, that you hear, you see, that ultimately you are the audience that all we do. So Lord, thank you. We praise you. And may all glory be given to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> uh, if you don't know, I'm a baseball fan. Um, and to be quite honest, uh, there's only one successful team in L.A. right now, and you know who that is. It ain't the Lakers. Um, but uh, there's a, there's a, there was a unique team in the history of baseball. And it, their name was the Oakland A's, or Oakland Athletics. And it was unique that in 1972, <clears throat> they had a lot of very unusual guys on that team. There was a guy named Reggie Jackson who by all accounts was flamboyant, egotistical, selfish, didn't care about anyone else, along with two other guys named Joe Rudy and Raleigh Fingers. And they were the prototypical people, gentlemen, baseball players, who did not care to listen to anyone, even the coach, the manager, or anyone else. But somehow together, they won three World Championships. Three World Series Championships in baseball. And the reason why I bring them up is because a lot of people point to them as being a prime example of being a great team, but in which people don't like each other. See, many baseball analysts Bring them up because they are the example. When someone says, oh yeah, we all need to love each other and care for each other as teammates to be successful. And there's always those people that says, what about those Oakland A's? They had no team chemistry. There was no love for each other. 
But as they would say, we may not have loved each other, but we simply got along enough to win. That may be the case in baseball or football or many team sports. But does that work for a church? Does a simple idea of like, yeah, as long as we could just kind of coexist, we could be a, a really good church. Can we simply say, yeah, I could bear with him or her to be a great church? And the answer is no, and I'm going to prove it to you why. Because we're going to go through what's called the idea of fellowship. Because as, as a theologian said, those who love and have fellowship with Jesus Christ, it is a necessity to have fellowship with his people. Let me repeat that, and it's on a slide. Those who love and have fellowship with Jesus Christ, it is a necessity to have fellowship with his people. Thus, it is inherent for those who have a relationship with God, they must have a relationship with other people, other believers. That is a necessity, and we call that fellowship. And why discuss the idea of fellowship? Because I think a lot of it gets misused, or maybe even misunderstood. For instance, is it simply a fellowship when, when believers get together? So hypothetically speaking, Let's see, um, me and Kenny, the praise leader that was here, maybe one day we got together and we talked about how much we love collecting Barbie dolls. We don't. But just say hypothetically. Oh, do you like that Barbie? Oh, no, I like the 1976 version. Oh, that's wonderful. And which outfit do you like? And afterwards, we talk about baseball. Was that fellowship? No. We're just talking. Nothing more than that. And this is what fellowship is. Fellowship is the idea of koinonia. That's the Greek word for fellowship. And it says the close analysis of the word shows that Apostle Paul never uses it in a secular sense, but always in a religious one. Then repeat that. A close analysis of the word, the study of it, shows that Paul never uses it in a secular sense, but always in a religious one. Fellowship is within the context of a spiritual walk with God. And that's something that uh, fellowship has to be. You can't just simply get together and talk about Barbie, or talk about sports, or the idea of like, hey, let's talk about the weather. That is not the idea of fellowship. It's more. And what it means to be more is to say that we are going to really delve into the idea of our faith. The outpouring of our faith should be in our discussion, our time together. 1 John 1, 7 says, But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. So it really demonstrates the idea that when we are walking with God, we have that intimate connection and relationship. It comes out. Another example is Acts 2.42, where it talks about that those who are in the light, meaning believers, when they have fellowship, there is something powerful that happens. So within the context of spiritual as opposed to secular, something amazing happens. When we devote ourselves to something that is the very identity of who we are, something happens. Thus Christians are called to have fellowship with each other. Not only having discussions or talks about clothes or baseball, but to have time of fellowship means that we talk about our faith, the journey of our faith. And, and, and oftentimes when we talk about the realities of our faith, it's not just simply saying, hey, what does this passage say in John chapter 2? That's part of it. Why did Jesus have 12 disciples, not 15? But the realities of our faith is really talking about our joys, our struggles, our questions. To wonder out loud, saying, 
these are something that God is doing in my life. It is this idea that we're going to get together and be real with each other. That's what I, that, that's what I really, that's how I'm going to term fellowship. To get together and be real with each other. Because when we come to church, I hate to say this, and some of you would nod in agreement. Sometimes we come to church and we put on a mask. Amen? Because maybe we're afraid to reveal who we are. Maybe we're afraid to reveal what's going on. Maybe we're afraid because, as they say, some people are so judgy. I love that word, judgy. And that's why I think a lot of church dynamics fail. Because when everyone has their mask on, there is no true fellowship. So why is fellowship important? One of the reasons it allows for spiritual growth for the individual as well as others in the ministry. When a group of people are willing to fellowship with each other, wonderful things happen. I want to give you a Rick Warren's quote. Rick Warren says, it is impossible to fulfill all the other purposes God had for your life without fellowship. You were not meant to be here on earth alone, to go through your life on your own. He makes that statement because believers have to be encouraged. That people grow when others laugh and cry with each other and spur each other on. Fellowship is Critical to our journey. Because as it says, to have fellowship is a means to understand who we are on this earth. And we forget that. Fellowship is almost like a touchstone for who we are. Um, how many of you ever saw uh, the movie Castaway? Again, I love movies. Okay? And you remember Tom Hanks? And he's, ta he's talking to the volleyball. Do you remember that? Wilson? I love that. He talks to Wilson. And what does he do that reminds him of home? He looks at the little, remember the little locket? I don't know if you remember. He keeps looking at the locket, which has a picture of his girlfriend or his fiance. And it keeps him going. It keeps him going to say, I am going to keep living every day. He looks at the picture and reminds him, I'm not going to give up, even though I've been stuck on this island for days and weeks and months. He says, this is the reason why I am going to keep going, even though I am, I am here all alone. When we have fellowship, when we get together with other people and go through and share life together, it is a reminder why I keep going. Why I keep striving. Why I endure and I persevere every day for my faith. It is a reminder that God is real in my life. And when we don't have that, it's so easy as human beings to kind of put God in the back burner. You know what scares me sometimes is um, I've, had, I've known some people, some men and women, who travel a lot for business and so on, so on. I remember one person said, you know what, I've been gone so long that I forgot what church is all about. And it kind of alarmed me because you know, he, he, was, he was always traveling. He was always missing Sundays. And he said, I haven't been to church in over six weeks. And I kind of like forgot what it was all about. I said, six weeks isn't that long. Right? That's six Sundays. But in six Sundays, he kind of lost that idea of church. Imagine six weeks, you've already kind of lost that. How many of you have gone away and not gone to church for a couple weeks? And it becomes not so much as I miss it, it's more like, oh, yeah. Fellowship is important because it is a reminder of who we are and what we're part of. And the central idea within fellowship is spoken in John 15, 9. 
As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. First Peter 2, uh, 17 says, love the brotherhood. That means we need to love each other. Our fellow believers in our body called Indonesian Evangelical Church, we got to love each other. We got to love each other. The essence of fellowship is not about, oh, I'm just going to deal with him or her. It's to say that I want to love him or her. But we get further along. It makes it very clear to me. There's been a movement uh, in in recent years. uh, It talked about the idea of why do we need to go to church at all? I have this relationship with God. Why do I need to be with other people, right? And and it's kind of, uh, to me, sad. Because I don't know if you've noticed, but there's always those two kind of groups of people, right? Those who, like, who are introverted and they, they don't really enjoy being with other people. And there are those who are very extra, they enjoy, right? And those who are, who are introverted, being uncomfortable with people sometimes is an excuse to say, I don't want to go to church or I don't want to fellowship. Or sad, another sad reality is some people have been burned by church or burned by people within a church. And what happens? Oh, I don't want to go to church at all because they've left a scar in my heart. But understand this. Church is about a place of broken people coming together for fellowship and worship. I never would ever, ever, ever want to hear this. You know what? I'm going to leave that person alone. I'm not going to talk to that person because I think he or she should be alone. Church is a place where people go to be with other people. And if you ever think, oh, that I am not going to talk to that person or him or her because I think he or she wants to be alone, That's a contradiction. People don't come to church to be alone. Let me repeat that. People do not come to church to be alone. When you have the idea of, oh, I'm not going to talk to him or her, or that person is someone that I'm not going to approach, because in your mind you say that person should be alone, that's like saying, I want to be alone. That's why you go to a Taylor Swift concert, right? Right? That's ridiculous. Like, that's an, that's an oxymoron. Oh, I want to go to a nice warm weather. I'm going to Alaska. That's an oxymoron. So our mindset has to be that within the church body, we should want to approach each other. Let me repeat that. Within the church body, no one is going to be in a situation where you should say, I'm not going to talk to him or her. The body of Christ is about interconnectedness. And when you say, I do not want to, because for whatever reason you think that person should be avoided or not talked to, then you do not understand the idea of church or fellowship. We need to connect, it's vital. When we say we don't want to connect, you are simply saying, I do not love. And God is love. All right. So I want to get very technical here. I want to state the aspects of fellowship. And what I mean by that is, what are the ingredients to fellowship? Because you may say, okay, what should I do in fellowship? Okay, Pastor Steve. All right. And so here's the two aspects. First aspect of fellowship is the idea of sharing or share. And there are three ideas that I hope we could, I want to share with you. There is the idea of sharing our experiences. So when you get together, share your experiences, both good and bad. The things that worked, the mistakes, 
Because some of us have experienced some things and we have some experiences that are both good and bad. But nobody here has experienced everything. I remember uh, the, the Thanksgiving retreat. There was like a little question and answer session. And I was like, oh, anyone have questions for me? And I'm going to say it was one of the twins that asked this question. Do you have any regrets? Was that one of you guys? Why do I remember they don't? Okay, I remember, okay. I was like, I was like okay. He says, do you have any regrets? And I was like, and my, my typical answer for that is like, I don't look at regrets. What I've done in the past, some things I'm ashamed of and I wish I never did. But in some ways, I am where I am because of the both good and bad. I think we have a lot to learn from each other. But we don't learn from each other or those things that help us grow unless we're willing to share our past experiences. What if, I, what if we never talked about the idea of like, oh yeah, I used to use drugs. And it's a horrible thing. How about the idea of simply this? I remember hiking. Right? Martin, Eva led it. And we went on this trail. And there was like this little stream. Okay? And what you've got to do is you've got to step on that rock then that, that, that tree, and jump across. Well, guess what I did? I didn't step on that rock. I stepped on another rock. And what happened? I slipped. And went, Psh, right, you were there. I, I, my foot got wet. I was like, like, Psh, like, oh, man, I got wet. Well, guess what someone learned? Don't do what Pastor Steve did. <laughs> right? Hello? So when we get together with people, be willing to share about our successes as well as our failures. Because there may be people who are walking behind us that may be going through the same thing. Are you willing to say, hey, these are my mistakes. Please hear what I have to say. Because in the end, it helps the church grow. The second aspect is the idea of breaking bread. The idea of table fellowship or breaking bread is not just eating. Okay? Hey, let's have table fellowship at In N Out Burgers, you know, and just like and 30 minutes later we just take off. The whole idea of table fellowship or breaking bread together is that when one person says, hey, you want to uh, go and you know, come over. So 2,000 years ago, I would, I would say, hey, Rudy, would you like to join us at my home for dinner? And Rudy says, hmm, let me think about it. He ponders it, he ponders it and says, Sure. And when, when Rudy comes over, <clears throat> the invitation and him joining us is the idea that I am inviting you into my life. Okay? Table fellowship had this ritual, this understanding of that when I invite you and you accept my invitation, you are accepting my invitation to be part of my life. That we're going to share life together. So when Rudy and, and, and they come over and, and we're sharing, it is a signaling to each other. We are interconnected now. You respect me, I respect you. I will hear you and I will listen to you. I will speak, you will speak, and we will both encourage each other. The whole idea of table fellowship is the idea that we are going to be joined together and we're going to go through life together. Likewise, when we break bread together, it is a way of saying, hey, you're part of my life. And I'm part of your life. You know, we call that friends. 
We call that many things. But in the church, we see we we're going to break together and we're going to have fellowship with each other. We're going to be brothers and sisters of Christ. So I don't care if it is in and out. I love sushi. All right? So if you want me part of your life, you know what to get me. All right? Korean barbecue or good bread or good pastry. Mm. So break bread together or break a burrito together. I don't care. Because, you know, food becomes like the centerpiece or the reason why we get together, right? right? How many times have you invited people over and, like, you just serve crackers and carrots, right? Like, you know, all the moms here are like, oh, no, 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 that's insulting. We got, we got to bring something nice. Right? It's like, well, get some pizza, huh? P- what? Are you crazy? Right? But it's, that is a signaling to those who come into the house that we want to be joined together. So let's spend time breaking bread together as a signal, as a means, as a way to say, I want to share life. I want to share life together. The third area, third aspect that we should share is, is sharing our victories currently in difficulties. It says in Romans 12, 15, Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. We should weep with those who weep. God is telling us to mourn together and cry together, as well as sharing in victories together. You know, I, I was really touched a few weeks ago when our brother Soup came up, and you know, as he was presiding, he talked about, you know, he, w- he was really um, kind of like heartbroken by what he heard about um, our little Owen. You know, Owen is less than two years old, and he's going through some um, food issues. He can't digest. And then he was hospitalized. He was a NICU, which is neonatal uh, intensive care. You know, there was, there was this, that question of, like, what's going to happen? And, you know, and he was praying. And you know, a lot of us were praying. And, you know, and he came to church. And, he, and I saw him. And he's, he's moving around like any other little kid. Man, that brings people together. Sharing victory and sharing struggles. It brings the idea that we're going to work together to grow together. We need to be able to share our struggles, our difficulties, because that's how we strive to share victories. It brings people together and a reminder that God is working in our lives. I mean, how great is it, you know, when he shared about Owen, and when I first heard about Owen, I was like, oh my, that's horrible. And you know, I see him, you know, it just like almost brought me to tears. Because someone said, oh, Owen's here. It's like, what? Owen's here? Let me see. You know, I, I run off to the nursery, right? And there he is. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. He's like, he's like alive and, and walking around. And, and, you know, and there are prayer requests. And if you don't know, there's a, per, there's a, there's a initials KHS. You know, he, he went through surgery. He's doing well. If you don't know who KHS, don't worry about it. But he had triple, by, triple bypass surgery. You know what pre- triple bypass surgery means? Three parts of your heart is clogged. But he had the surgery and he's doing well. Struggles. Come together and pray and work together to see victory. That's when we come together and have fellowship, we could be united in Christ. The second aspect of fellowship, and this is critical. So the first aspect is to share. The second aspect of fellowship is to show love and respect for each other. Your actions 
should speak about love and respect. I repeat that. All that you do should show love and respect for each other, for the brothers and sisters in our spiritual family. Above all, as it says in 1 Peter 4, 8, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers, covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. Okay? The idea of bearing with each other. If you ever ask, Pastor, I, I want to have fellowship. I, I want to be a good brother and sister to the rest of the church. Is there a general rule? Yeah. Whatever you do, do it for love and respect for that person. Okay? If you can't answer that question with an affirmative yes, different way. Slow down, change, or whatever. But if you say, I'm going to do something, uh, I, I, I am going to give him this gift, or I'm going to do this for this person, or I want to share this, I want to say this, or I want to talk about that, or I want to approach him or her, and I, I want to uh, discuss something. It should always be with love and respect. Okay? And respect is super important. Because this is what, what kind of bothers me, right? The young folks here, you 16, 18, 20-year-olds, 20 25-year-olds, right? You're told to be respectful to those who are older, right? I mean, that's, that's, that's like told over and over again. Be respectful. Be respectful. Be respectful. But I also believe those who are a little bit older than 25, 35, 45, 55, and beyond, we should also be respectful to those who are younger. Okay? Because they're part of the body. They're brothers and sisters of Christ. Don't simply say, ah, oh, you young ones, yeah, yeah, yeah. quiet, you know. I, I, that, I, I see no love and respect by disparaging those who are young. Because they have things that they've gone through. They have struggles. And to disparage that is to disregard their feelings and their emotions and their walk with God. Too often we disparage. They, they, they talk about, oh, Oh, this happened on Instagram or Snapchat or like, oh, social media. So childish. It may be childish for you because you're 45. <clears throat> but that's a real struggle for them. They may have issues with school. Oh, that's, don't worry about it. No, but they're worrying about it. So show love and respect. And I think a lot of our, uh, our older folks, and I mean older as in those who are above 30, I think we do have this idea of we want to love our young people. But I want to remind all of us, doesn't matter age or our place in life, show love and respect. Because they deserve it. We deserve it. Because we were all young one time. And our hurts and our pains are real, regardless of what anyone else thinks. If we love God and we love our brothers and sisters, we will not stumble them. And by disparaging their pain and their struggle, we're disparaging them. And we're saying, ha, huh, you don't matter. May your actions always reveal love and respect. <clears throat> Let me close with this. Uh, Mother Teresa, you may have heard of her, spent her, her life working, as you know, with the poorest of the poorest in India. And she was once asked, how do you handle all the death and disease on a daily basis? How do the tough things, when it comes to you, 
How do you deal with the pain of serving? And her answer was this. Every person I bathe, every person I bandage, I imagine seeing the face of Jesus, and I do it for him. That's the attitude that's behind this. It is the attitude of Matthew chapter 25, verse 40. Just as you did it to one of the least of these who are the members of my family, you did it to me. So when we have fellowship, it goes back to that very first verse. It is the idea. We love because he first loved us. So when we fellowship, and when you question the idea of should I have fellowship, should I talk, should I have a sit down, whatever it is, do you love? And I hope as a church, we're willing to get together, spend time together, to have fellowship. So guys, it's cool to talk about cooking. It's cool to cook. It's cool to talk about baseball, talk about those stinking Lakers. Okay? That's fine. But at a certain point, let's delve deeper. And ladies, you have your own discussions. I, I, you know, I, 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 don't, I have no idea what you guys talk about. All right, I don't know. Tea parties? Who knows? But let's go a little deeper than simple, the veneer of our lives. You know what I'm talking about, the veneer? Just the, just the top coating, the wax that we put on our cars. Or, or, or Let's go a little bit deeper. And if we are really going to be a church that is dynamic, that is loving, we've got to be able to do that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we know, Lord God, that we are called to have fellowship with you and fellowship with each other. We know, Lord God, that we are called to do so, not just simply because... It's a thing to do. It's not just to check off a box. But through fellowship, Lord God, we grow in our faith. We grow in our walk with you in a powerful way. And we are reminded who we are. So, Lord God, give us cause to say, yes, I am going to spend time with people and go deeper than simply the veneer of my life, the coding, because we're more than that, because we have all hearts and thoughts and feelings and our hopes and our desires. So, Lord, be with us and guide us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.